Our scripture reading today, if you would like to follow along with me, <clears throat> our scripture reading is Ephesians chapter 4, 1 to 16. I don't know if any of you have ever seen my Bible before. It's a, it's a little one. I've always loved it because it's small and I can carry it anywhere, but I, I'm starting to have a trouble reading these little small print. <laughs> yeah, I... Everybody said, boy, you can read that. And I always take pride in the fact I could. And now it's it's a little harder. So hopefully I get this right today. This is Ephesians 4, 1 to 16. It says this, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. We could speak a lot just on that one verse. It says, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. And to each of us, grace has been given as Christ has given it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? Well, he who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ gave some to be apostles and some prophets, others evangelists, pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. For him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So this morning, our scripture is really about two things, two important things that we'll address. One is unity, and the other is maturity, and our Christian commitment to both of those things. Paul opens this chapter and he does so pleading with the people by saying, as a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. And Paul says this because he's in jail. And he writes this letter to the church in Ephesus, uh, a church that he began, these people that he loves. And so from jail, he is telling them to live a life worthy. And he has the authority to do this because he's in jail for the gospel and for them. He's living that. He's living it. He has the right to urge them to live a life worthy because he is doing it. He has made great sacrifices. And so he has, ha- has the right to tell them to live a life worthy of the calling. This verse reminded me, I don't know if any of you have seen the movie Saving Private Ryan. It is uh, about 12 or so guys led by a commander who go in search of one private during World War II. They, they've been given this special mission to go out and save Private Ryan from the front lines because his brothers have all been killed. He doesn't know that, but they have been killed. He's the only one left of his mother's sons, and she is a widow. And so the government doesn't want to see all this woman's sons killed in battle. And so they send out a search mission to find Uh, private Ryan and bring him home to his mother and so this group of 12 guys led by Tom Hanks character enter into these dangerous places to retrieve Ryan and get him out of there and in the process of doing that some give their life well one of the most moving scenes is at the end of the movie when the commander Tom Hanks character has been shot he's dying in the field But he has done it. He has gotten Ryan out into safety. And in his last breaths, he calls Ryan over to him. And he says to this young man, earn this. In other words, live your life. Live a life worthy of the men who have sacrificed so that you get to go home. 
And it is a very moving scene because immediately from there, it flashes forward 50 years to Arlington Cemetery. And this man, Ryan, is now old and he's with his wife and kids and grandkids all around him. And in this moment, he has a loan at the grave of his commander who years earlier saved him and told him to earn this. And he kneels at that grave, realizing all that's been given to him. And he cries, hoping that he has earned it, a life worthy of the sacrifices. In the same way, Paul is saying, he is opening this chapter and he's saying, as a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. For each of us, there is 2,000 years worth of men and women who have given their life for us to know the gospel. There have been parents who have sacrificed lots. In our Christian faith, there is Jesus who gave it all on a cross for us. There are missionaries and apostles who gave up their life to spread the message that we might now know. And so Paul is saying, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. I heard a pastor uh, from Nigeria once. We had this pastor from a year come and speak at one of the churches I was serving at. And he spoke about his life. And he spoke about how he and his family escaped from his country and, and the suffering that his family endured there because they were Christians. And how he has known so many who have given their life for Christ. Um, and he was so thankful to them. And, and when he spoke, it was foreign to all of us, <laughs> you know, as he's sharing about his life and the stories in his life. And he would talk of friends who were killed because they were teaching about Jesus. He talked about how he himself was beaten for being baptized and how far his family would travel when they were living there just to get with other believers in hiding and how they would look forward to every week to getting together and, and they didn't have a building. They had a small little house that they would meet in. And they only had a few Bibles. And they would huddle around someone who had one. And they would read and they would pray and they would sing for hours. As he mentioned this, how he knew he had to now share the gospel with others. Who had, others had risked it for him. And now he needed to risk it for others. And to hear him speak was just almost foreign to all of us. Who had been pretty complacent probably in our faith compared to him. And I remember just as he left our sanctuary, he was taking pictures of everything. Even this cross that we had made for Easter in our sanctuary. He says, so beautiful. He says, so beautiful. And it's the same kind of feeling I felt when I was in Haiti. We stayed with a local doctor who lived next door to the church in that village. And about 4.30 every morning, we would hear singing as people came together. Dozens and hundreds even would gather every morning for prayer and praise. And then we saw what they were doing as they took care of people, as they reached out and shared with others, as they shared their food with people. And being with them, just like that Nigerian pastor, just made us want to live better for Jesus. Paul opens this by saying, as a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. And sometimes we just need a little perspective. Well, the two things that he really urges us to do here, we all can do. The first one is keep the unity. And the second one is grow to maturity. So to live a life worthy of the calling, Paul first mentions these two things, unity and maturity. And I'll just explain them one at a time what he means. Beginning with unity, he says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace because there's only one body and one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism in God who's over all, through all, and in all. So first he's saying, basically, love one another. Don't divide. You're stronger together. Don't let this world and lesser things pull you apart. There's just one Lord, and you're both bowing to him. There's one faith you both have. You both have the same hope in common. So work hard. Humble yourself to keep the unity of the Spirit. 
And first off, I want to say that we're, what we're talking about here, what's in this chapter, boy, you could apply it to a family going through things, a country going and divided, or a whole world. Um, it's, it's all, you could apply that same message of what brings unity um, to, to any of those circles that, that we're in. You know, to remember the greatest command is to love even our enemies and do good to them, to be kind, be patient, to work for peace. Um, God cares about it. He wants it in all the circles of our life. And so if we desire unity in our marriage, these principles listed are essential to having it. You're going to have to be humble, as we all know, in a marriage if it's going to work. Pride is going to divide us. Arrogance will ignite us. Humility is the way. Um, you also got to be gentle and think about what you say and how you're going to say it. You, you got to be patient to, with people. These truths are true for any of the circles we're in to have better unity. So whether it's a marriage, a congress, or every workplace, friendship, family needs, is going to need this to keep together. But saying that, getting that out of the way, what I realized in studying this chapter a little deeper is that Paul is specifically here talking about unity in the church. That is really what he's focused in. Not just all the little circles, even though those matter. Unity in the church is what he's saying. And it's a special type of unity that we have in Jesus Christ and how we are members of the body of Christ and we're bound to each other and we need to work to keep that unity with other believers because it's going to be tested. Paul is focused here on the church, the body of Christ, speaking about how and why it is so important that we keep the unity in church. And and as I read that, I looked and I flipped back to Acts chapter 2 and 4, when the church is just beginning. I thought of that. And how Jesus had just risen from the dead. He had ascended into heaven. The apostles had just gone out and started to preach that message. And other people were gathering. So as the church is just beginning. In Acts 2, it talks about what that church was like. And how they gathered together, it says, in those early days. And they had everything in common. And it says they enjoyed the favor of all the people. And it says God was able to do many miracles among them. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. It's this beautiful picture of what we were meant to be. And then in Acts 4.32 it says all the believers were one in heart and mind. And God's grace was at work within them. And they shared everything that they had together. So the picture of the early church is one of unity. Family, humility, one heart, one mind, working towards one goal, sharing everything, supporting one another to, to fulfill that common mission to, to bring the gospel to other people. And so at first, it was one in those early days. <laughs> but by the time of Paul, which is 40 years later, you know, the, he's writing here to the church in Ephesus about 40 years later, and the church is already fracturing. Different ideas are coming into the church that are not biblical. Personalities with egos. Problems of one group thinking that their widows are getting less attention than other widows. And divisions are starting to distract and divide. And in one way, it's like the honeymoon is worn off. And they're now having to learn the harder work of loving and staying together for the long haul. And so Paul is reminding him, you're going to have to work hard to keep the unity. Just like a marriage requires it to be one body, love takes work. And so this unity in the body of Christ was also something that we see was important to Jesus. For he knew it was going to be tested. And so on the night before he went to the cross... He prays for unity. <laughs> he prays uh, for the apostles and for us and our churches. In John 17, 21, he says, I pray that they would be one. Father, just as you and I are one, may they also be in us and us in them so that they might be brought to complete unity. And then Jesus says this, then a world will know that you sent me and have loved them as you loved me. So Jesus said, then a world will know. Our love and unity together is part of our effectiveness for mission and evangelism. In those early days of the church, it was one heart and mind. They looked after each other. They shared everything and they all had a job to do and they all did their part. And the Lord, it says, added to their number daily those who were being saved. And there were great miracles among them. When we are one and loving each other well together using our per gifts for a common purpose, God is able to do miracles in the body of Christ. But Jesus knew that a house divided against itself would fall. 
Uh, in fact, before Abraham Lincoln said it, Jesus said that word. And he knew that a message of love and grace from God would not go forth in the world if people who bore that message could not get along themselves. And so Paul is saying something important here about unity. Having a common message, a common mission, a common heart, and looking after each other. And Jesus here in his prayer, he says, he compares it here. He talks about how he and the Father are one. The Son and the Father are one. And he prays that just as they are, we would be. And he does that by inviting us into himself so that we'll be bought into complete unity. For in him there is no vision, no division. Um, so for God is not divided. His spirit doesn't speak of its own, on, a, on its own, but only that which he hears from the Father. And so it's in perfect unity. So the Son only does that which is the will of the Father. And so God is not divided among himself. There is no division in him. His will is not divided. And so if we are truly baptized into him, and if our faith is in him, and if our hope is in him, and if he is our Lord, and the Spirit lives in us, then what could possibly separate us from each other? Nothing. There is no division in God. It is when we let other gods have us that we begin to divide. It is when the God of self and greed and lust and pride begin to take over in our heart that we begin to split. It is when the God of this country or our own political party becomes our life and our Lord, then we begin to split. It is when we allow the other words to direct our paths and let our be our teachings and other things define us or leadings or even our own flesh. That is when we begin to split, when we step out of Christ and we get our mind off of him, when we are not fully surrendered and we allow fear <clears throat> rather than faith set our course, when we allow hate rather than love fill our heart. For Christ is not and cannot be divided. And so if we remain in him, we will remain united to our brother. But apart from Christ, there is no unity. And so Paul is saying, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit, to keep your mind and your heart on him and him being your Lord. And I love that Paul says, make every effort to keep it because it's not up to us to create it. It's only up to us not to destroy it. All that we have in Christ. God has joined us together. We just need to make sure we love one another well. Keep him as the center because the same shepherd will lead us. The same spirit will unite us in the bond of peace. So just a couple ways that he says how we can do this. The first one, he says, be completely humble. Don't think too much of yourself, basically. Uh, Philippians 2, 3, it says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value one another above yourself not looking to your own interest, but the interest of the others, have the same attitude as Christ, who in the very nature God didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but rather made himself nothing, taking the nature of a servant, being made into human likeness, he humbled himself unto death on a cross. So this is a self-examination for each of us. Do we have a humble attitude, a servant attitude with others in the church or in our family? Um, humility is not seen too much in social media or valued too much in our world, business, sports, or politics, but it is necessary for unity. And as Christians, we are to model it. You know, I think here of a person I know, very humble. Uh, when everybody else is complaining about something, uh, they're just trying to, to make it better behind the scenes. When everybody's gossiping about somebody else or judging them, they're just praying for them, sending them little notes without others knowing that they're doing it. Um, it's the attitude that brings you unity. Uh, it not only says humility, though, it says be gentle. The word there is meek, and that's an inward grace towards God and others. It means the, the heart of a servant, uh, where the Bible tells us not to tear down or slander one another, but only to speak in truth and love, uh, that which would benefit another person. Uh, so a meek person, in other words, would not say everything that they feel. They would keep some of it to themselves. And it, it would be considering the respect of all people. Um, when it must speak painful truths, it does in a way that does not disrespect or humiliate the other uh, who is also made in the image of God. I heard somebody put it this way, and I really liked the way that they said it. 
It said that meekness is between the person um, who is always angry and unleashing on everything and people are always nervous to be around them for fear they're just going to erupt. It's in between that person and the other extreme, the person who never says what needs to be said when it needs to be said. They just tolerate evil all the time and just feel like they got to be nice. Meekness is somewhere in between both extremes. It is getting angry, and I love this, at the right time for the right reason in the right way. At the right time for the right reason in the right way. There is a time to speak. There is a time to be angry. But there's also a right way to express it and a right time to do so. And some people don't think about that and they end up causing more harm than good. They explode and it causes divisions and splits. They embarrass, they disrespect, they burn bridges. And there's no grace in the midst of their truth. And so meekness is getting angry at the right time, the right reason, the right way. Um, think about you when you get angry, when somebody does that thing, even in the church that, that you just completely disagree with. Um, what do you do with that? And, and so uh, the next and final attitude I'll just mention here, the grass is about unity is patience. And that is bearing with one another in love. It means long suffering. It means forgiveness. Um, it means that everybody is a work in progress and they're going to take a little time to get it. Um, you know, it is small steps. And again, uh, it's making every effort, every effort. And so then, besides unity, this chapter is about maturity. And I just wanted to mention one little thing about that. For to live a life worthy is not to stay a baby Christian forever, but to grow in our faith, to grow in our knowledge of the Son of God in his word and in his service. I think here of Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, where it says, By now some of you ought to be teachers. And yet you still need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. You haven't grown. You, haven't, you can't live on milk forever, the scripture says. Solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good and evil. So he's talking here about people who've taken the time to study and learn God's word, have trained themselves within their own gifts to use them to be able to defend the faith and to serve others and to trust God better. It's a daily real thing, maturity. They've grown up. Today, I've said this to you before and you, you know it too, but one critique of the church in America is that it's a mile long and it's an inch deep. That the Christians, they, they don't know what they believe. They don't know any of the stories of the Bible. They don't know what the purpose of the church is. They're Christians, but they're just an inch deep. They believe, but they don't really know the Lord. They haven't grown up. Well, Paul in our chapter is saying, live a life worthy. Grow up. It's time to learn. It's time to, to not just take, but to give. It's time to not just say you believe, but to live and to learn it and to get out there with the message. For Christ has given his life to us and some are called to be apostles, others prophets and teachers and evangelists and pastors, all to equip people for acts of service so that the body of Christ, the church, might grow up, be not only to unity, it says, but verse 13, a greater knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So we are to seek maturity. And I love what it's saying here because it's not just talking about our own personal maturity, but maturity as a church. Then we'll no longer be infants, it says, tossed back and forth by every teaching and craftiness. And, and that's a real problem in the world today. And it was a real problem back in Paul's day uh, in Ephesus because it hadn't grown up in the faith and it didn't have a knowledge of the word. It kept getting pushed and persuaded by the latest teaching. And it kept getting flip-flopping and stagnant in its faith and its growth. And we can see the same in our church today. That because we haven't really read the Bible or learned what it says or why or what the church's purpose is, we get persuaded by the teachings of the world. And the kids learn different beliefs in school and college and from friends and other things. And they don't have enough to really stand their ground. We haven't read the word together as mom and dad and kids. We haven't been in church enough to really know. And so we get flippant in our faith and stagnant in our mission. Because we haven't grown up. We haven't matured, been really rooted and established and grown a foundation that's going to last. And because of it, some fade away in their faith and it's sad. As a church, we have to be for unity, but we also have to be for maturity. To both teach uh, uh, and to be taught ourselves. 
And we have to take seriously the call as parents uh, to raise our kids and as well as teachers here to study the word and to preach it and teach it correctly. And there are a lot of ideas out there that aren't Christian, but masquerade around as such. Do we know the difference? Can we point to the word of God and say, this is what we believe and why? Paul is saying, by now you should be a thriving church, but you're still a baby church. It's time to grow up, to commit to learning and using our gifts for the whole body so that the whole body might be mature. Um, my family, uh, this, this year, we, we're trying to do as a family the read through the Bible in a year. So each of my kids, my wife and I, we each have the readings we're supposed to do. We miss a number of days um, in that. But each week, once a week, we get together for just a very short amount of time. And we, we ask, what's one thing from the reading this week that, that you've been learning, that you didn't see maybe before, that you've just been learning? And we just kind of share that. And some things are just interesting facts. Some things mean something to our heart. But then um, I try to read maybe one little small section out of a chapter of what we have just read. And just we just pray. We're trying to do that in our family to just um, grow up a little. Um, you know, and I also, I teach my kids um, that this isn't just dad's job. It's every Christian's job to be in the church, to attend, as well as to grow here and to serve here. Every Christian's job. So I expect my kids to be serving somewhere in the church. I expect them to be here on Sunday morning and in youth groups, that they're growing as well and that they're welcoming people and that they're saying hi to people. And I want them to know that from the beginning, that this is their church. This is Christ's church. They're a part of it. And it's part of what being a Christian is, is to seek the unity and the maturity of the church. And so, Sometimes maturity is forced upon us, uh, like it says in the book of James, when our life is tested and we have to go through perseverance and we, it, it does maturity in us. But this is a commitment to maturity. And so I, I pray, as Paul says here, as a prisoner of the Lord, live a life worthy of the calling. Keep the unity in the body. Work for the maturity in yourself, family, and church. It's so necessary. Um, for there's only one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all is over all and through all and in all. Amen. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you again for, for your word, the things that it teaches us. And Lord, so many have given their life for us, not only in this, our family, but in our country and in our faith and the history of our faith that has been passed down from generation to generation that we might know. Help us to not destroy the unity of the Spirit and help us also to mature individually and as a church. In Jesus' name, amen.